Hello and welcome to the National D-Day Memorial's Lunchbox Lecture today. My name is John Long, the Director of Education here at the Memorial, and I'm very pleased that you've joined us for this fascinating talk coming up. But for right now, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, make a, uh, a small commercial for one of our newest initiatives. We now have a podcast. A uh, podcast titled Someone Talked, hosted by our friend and co uh, collaborator, John McManus, one of the best known military historians in the United States today. And uh, he is helping us to host this podcast, interviewing a lot of the other well-known historians uh, working and, and helping to preserve the history of World War II. Uh, you can find Someone talked on our webpage, but also uh, any podcast provider that you happen to use. And I hope you'll join us for that because we've had uh, already a couple of episodes of absolutely fascinating discussion with John. And we're looking forward to some new ones coming up. We'll be interviewing Joe Balkowski, one of the uh, premier uh, historians of D-Day, Alex Kershaw, who, of course, is best known for the Bedford Boys around here but has a new book out as well, and then many other uh, great historians coming up. So if you're a World War II buff, or even if you aren't, join us for Someone Talk. You, uh, you'll find it a fascinating discussion of the Second World War. But today, our guest and uh, is an old friend of the National D-Day Memorial, James Ransom, Captain, United States Navy, retired, who has been a volunteer as well as a board member for the National D-Day Memorial Foundation in the past. Jim earned his Bachelor of Science degree in history from the U.S. Naval Academy and then a Master of Arts in National Security and Strategic Studies from the U.S. Naval War College. Spent 30 years as a submarine officer for the United States Navy, uh, ultimately commanding the USS Miami from 1998 to 2000. And as the captain of the Miami, uh, led the ship in Tomahawk missile strikes against Iraq and Serbia. And the Miami's crew was awarded the 1999 Battenberg Cup, which is presented annually to the best ship in the Atlantic fleet. Um, so the short time duties included company officer hist and history professor at the Naval Academy, chief of staff for Pacific Submarine Force, and he completed his naval career teaching strategy and policy at the Naval War College. Uh, today, he is retired, but seemingly busier than ever. He's an adjunct professor at the Naval War College, teaching strategy and war uh, course to postgraduate students in Jacksonville. He has written on U.S. Asiatic fleet submarines at the start of World War II, as subject today uh, for Naval History Magazine, the Submarine Review, and the International Journal of naval history and uh pleased to announce he's currently working on a book on this little known aspect of american military history so this is going to be a fascinating talk uh jim kind of teased it for me just a little while ago uh point out that the first part is going to be a lot of kind of big picture history but then in the second part he will be zeroing in on some of the personalities involved including a few you've never heard of but uh, really helped to tell the tale of submarines uh, in the Pacific at the beginning of World War II. So let's bring Jim into the studio with us. And welcome, Jim. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Appreciate uh, it. Thank you for joining us. As you, if you've been a uh, follower of the National D-Day Memorial in the past, you know Jim has given in-person lectures for us uh, in, in on naval subjects, and uh, always fascinating. Always get great response. And so, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, to tell us about submarine operations in the early days of the war. All right, very good. Uh, if Adam could bring up the slides, or maybe, oh, I think I got them right there. Look at that. So, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, and it's great to be here. Uh, the National D-Day Memorial is one of my favorite places in the world. I am wearing my 2011 volunteer pin that I got uh, Sunday afternoons, uh, while I was working uh, in Lynchburg, I would go up and, uh, and give tours and, and just absolutely love the place. So 
the place and the people and everything they do is uh, something that uh, still amazes me to this day. So I'm really proud to be here today to talk to you. I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to talk about submarines, something near and dear to my heart. Uh, but we're going to talk about something that's uh, not very well known. Uh, and this is a project that I've been working on to, to kind of shed a little bit of light on this. Uh, United States Asiatic Fleet submarines in the first six months of the war. Uh, and and as, as John said, I'm going to do this in two parts. The first part is kind of an overview of uh, a very little known campaign, uh, essentially forgotten. Uh, and then the second part, we're going to zero in on a couple of people uh, that were took part in that. And to me, that's the fascinating part on this because, you know, campaigns, events, uh, objects like submarines, they're, they're interesting, but uh, the people is what captivates us and brings us back and draws us in. So that's what we're going to talk about here today. Um, and so we'll jump right in with uh, the first part of uh, today's talk. Um, submarines, uh, you know, if you know much about them, it's, it's the, the fact that the submarine force is called the silent service. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Submarines operate uh, essentially alone and unafraid behind enemy lines. That's their purpose is to go out there. Uh, in my time as a submariner, my first captain, when I was a young junior officer told me, you know what, if, if we aren't surrounded and outnumbered, we're in the wrong place. And that's come down to us through the years. I mean, that's the way that uh, American submarines in World War II thought the submariners thought that way and the submarines operated that way. Um, but, uh, most people are more familiar with uh, German U-boats, uh, but you know I, I find that fascinating. It, it gets all the publicity, but uh, in the history of the world, there have been three major unrestricted submarine warfare campaigns, two of them by uh, German Germany in World War I and World War II, but only the third one was successful, and that's the one uh, that was waged by American submarines in World War II in the Pacific. So... Uh, what you see there is the USS Swordfish, a fleet-type boat uh, commissioned uh, just prior to the war, and I would say arguably the best submarines in the world. Again, the U-boats get a lot of uh, attention, but they were much smaller than what you see there. They had fewer torpedoes. Uh, they were very cramped. Uh, they did, you know, they operated fairly well, uh, but American submarines were built uh, for far more. We'll talk about that as we go on. So this is uh, this is the playing field we're going to talk about uh, a little bit today. Um, in 1941, there was three uh, fleets in the United States Navy. There's the Pacific Fleet there in Hawaii, and you can see Hawaii uh, kind of in the upper left right hand corner of the of the slide there. And there's a little arrow coming out. Well, that's coming out of Japan. I guess that must be the Admiral de Gumo's task force uh, headed towards Pearl. Uh, Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December. But you had the Pacific Fleet in uh, Pearl Harbor. You had the Atlantic Fleet, uh, obviously, in the Atlantic. Both of those were large fleets. They each had many battleships. They had lots of uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, they had dozens of cruisers and even more dozens of destroyers, and, and they had submarines. So those are two fleets. And then you had this third fleet, United States Asiatic Fleet, uh, much smaller, uh, no battleships no aircraft carriers, uh, one cruiser, one heavy cruiser, one light cruiser, 13 destroyers, and some submarines. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, here today. Uh, the Asiatic fleet was uh, based out of Manila in the Philippines. That, uh, that's where they were, and they operated there at the very start of the Second World War. The commander of the Asiatic fleet was this gentleman here, Admiral Tommy Hart. He was actually a submariner himself. He had uh, been involved with uh, torpedo development, uh, submarine design and operations for decades. Uh, and in fact, he was the senior submarine officer in the United States Navy at the start of the war. Uh, in fact, it's, he, he was a tough guy. I mean, he was, he was tough. Uh, he was extremely well-respected within the Navy. Uh, he had almost been assigned as the commander of the Pacific Fleet in Pearl Harbor just before the war, uh, but Franklin D. Roosevelt didn't really care for him all that much, didn't like him as a person, so it went to somebody else. 
There have been people that have said, had Tommy Hart been the commander of the Pacific Fleet, that what happened that day might have ended up a little bit differently. It may not have been a surprise. He had his fleet, the Asiatic fleet, very well prepared for war. Problem again, very small, right? Not It's essentially a speed bump to the entire Japanese fleet. Its purpose during the war was mostly, or prior to the war, was mostly diplomatic uh, as well as presence. Uh, keep an eye on what was going on with, uh, with the Japanese out there. Uh, Hart uh, very much was interested in beefing up his fleet before the war, and so he asked for reinforcements, uh, hoping to get uh, some battleships, maybe a division of battleships or an aircraft carrier. None of that was forthcoming. But the Navy was uh, good about sending him submarines. And so uh, just before the start of the war, <clears throat> USS Holland, the submarine tender, came out with the 12 submarines of Submarine Squadron 2 from Pearl Harbor. They arrived in November 1941, just on the cusp of war. That beefed up the submarine forces in the Asiatic fleet to a total of 29 submarines, <clears throat> which essentially made the submarine force the most uh, important striking element of the Asiatic fleet. Here you see a couple of uh, uh, the submarines of the day. On the left is a fleet type boat, one of those more modern submarines, uh, that's Seawolf. <clears throat> uh, she had uh, four forward torpedo tubes, four aft torpedo tubes. She had excellent endurance. She had a lot of uh, 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 enhancements, I guess you'd call them, for habitability so that the, the ship could operate in the Pacific, uh, tropical climates. So uh, a very uh, a very capable unit. Uh, the ship on the right is uh, what, what was known as an S-boat. Uh, the submariners actually referred to them as pig boats because they were so, I guess, you know, they, they were tough to operate in. <clears throat> Much smaller, fewer torpedoes, um, no air conditioning, uh, harder to live, live in. Uh, so at the start of the war, we had 23 of those fleet boats operating out of Manila and six of the older S-class submarines. Uh, just to, you know, to give a little bit of background, uh, we all know what happened on the 7th of December in Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> well, on the 8th, it was the 8th of December in Manila uh, across the international date line. And... Uh, you know, the Japanese, in addition to Pearl Harbor, they conducted multiple operations at the same time. So that at the same time they were attacking Pearl Harbor, they were attacking in Malaya, they were attacking in Thailand, uh, Hong Kong, they, uh, they were attacking the Philippines, Guam, the Gilbert Islands. Uh, so th th they had a very uh, well-sequenced and well-orchestrated uh, uh, series of operations. Um, on that day, the 8th of December, uh, the Japanese ended up destroying uh, American air power, essentially, in, in the uh, Far East. Uh, General MacArthur, uh, who was the uh, Army commander in, uh, in Manila, for whatever reason, and it's been debated to this day, and all, all I could do is give conjecture, uh, but uh, for whatever reason, he ended up with all his planes on the ground, and the Japanese came in. And, uh, and destroyed most of them. So, so essentially at the start of the war, we had lost all air cover, which is gonna make it hard to base uh, ships and especially submarines out of, uh, out of Manila. Uh, on that day that the war started, of those 29 submarines, there was only two that were underway. Uh, and both were old S boats, uh, S-36 and Lingayen Gulf, which, uh, by the way, is the location that uh, both the Army and the Navy had predicted for decades where the Japanese would eventually land if we, they went to war with the United States. So they put uh, S-36 right there in Lingayen Gulf, and S-39 was overseeing the uh, San Bernardino Strait off to the east side of uh, the island Luzon. So two of 29 uh, underway, and some could fault uh, Admiral Hart. In fact, I fat fault Admiral Hart for not having more submarines underway. Uh, it's something that he that, that might have made a difference. Uh, so uh, over the next two days, uh, seven uh, fleet-type boats were deployed out of Manila. 
uh, to operate off Japanese bases in Formosa, which is now Taiwan, uh, Hainan Island, and Indochina, where the Japanese had bases. And so those were kind of our four deployed away game type boats. Uh, he also deployed six submarines off the east coast, I'm sorry, the west coast of Luzon, the island of Luzon. Uh, and there was a total of uh, 10 more that were deployed to the east and to the south. And those guys were essentially in defensive areas and with the idea that, you know, when the Japanese eventually came, uh, these, the, these guys would locate them. Ideally, you'd have air power to locate them further out so that you can concentrate your submarines, but that was no longer a possibility. Uh, so that would make it more difficult. But the whole idea was some of the submarines would find them, you vector the rest in and attack the invasion convoy. Uh, one event that uh, is going to play in the second half of our story today uh, happened on the 10th of December, where the Japanese bombed the uh, Cavite Navy Yard in Manila Bay. Uh, we did have, uh, most of our ships were, at that point, uh, had left, uh, were, were going out to operate against the Japanese. Uh, there were two submarines that were, uh, that were still there. They had been in overhaul. They were frantically trying to put them back together. Uh, and one of them was actually hit by a uh, by two bombs and was sunk. That was USS Sea Lion. So uh, keep that in mind. We're going to come back to the good ship Sea Lion. But uh, with the uh, with the bombing of Cavite Navy Yard, kind of the 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 writing was uh, was was there now. The you know we'd lost all our air power. We'd lost our infrastructure to. Uh, and, and logistics for the submarines. So it was not going to be much longer that we'd be able to operate submarines out of Manila. Sure enough, on the 22nd of December, as predicted for decades, the Japanese invasion force uh, arrived at Lingayen Gulf. Uh, our submarines were ineffective, uh, although they did locate it. Uh, the one that uh, located it, the Stingray, uh, didn't make any attacks, uh, did report the contact, uh, but by the time that all that information got uh, to the right people, uh, the invasion convoy was inside Lingayen Gulf. And although they, uh, they sent lots of uh, boats to try and enter the Gulf and attack, uh, it didn't work out. The only one that was able to get into the shallow waters of Lingayen Gulf was one of the old S boats, S-38. Uh, she got in and in a, an amazing 48 hours of being attacked, depth charged, uh, having a battery explosion and all kinds of other problems, she managed to sink one Japanese ship. But the largest Japanese convoy of the entire Second World War essentially escaped uh, unmolested uh, to land the 40,000 40, troops, uh, uh, Japanese troops in the Philippines. Okay? So at that point, uh, as you can see from this slide, the, uh, the Japanese are going to make their way down south uh, MacArthur pulls, uh, decides that, who had initially decided he wanted to fight from the beaches. Uh, his troops had gotten swatted back from the beaches, so he decided he needed to go back to plan A, which was uh, War Plan Orange or the Rainbow Plan, and move his uh, troops into Bataan, set up for a, a long siege. Uh, but at this point, the writing, again, it's, it's, it's even clearer. Manila is in big trouble. Uh, MacArthur on uh, on Christmas Eve, December 24th, he sent uh, out word that uh, Manila was an open city, uh, would be evacuated, uh, trying to spare it from destruction by the Japanese. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't coordinate with the Navy commander. Nobody told Admiral Hart that was happening or going to be even considered. So uh, Admiral Hart had to quickly scramble. Uh, he boarded a submarine, the USS Shark, uh, the next day uh, and headed down south to set up for the next phase of the campaign, the defense of the uh, Dutch East Indies. Uh, so in these first three weeks of the war, one of the things that came to, came to light <clears throat> was that US submarines were not as effective as they had hoped they would be. They thought they'd have a lot of sinkings, uh, put a real dent in the Japanese invasion forces and other ships, uh, and that just wasn't happening. Uh, the submariners reported that there was uh, there were problems with erratic torpedoes, and they had perfectly set up short-range attacks that couldn't miss, and they missed. So the, the there was torpedo problems, and that word was starting to get out. 
This will be a problem throughout the entire campaign. It's not really the purpose of our discussion today, but I would tell you uh, this is probably one of the more major uh, procurement scandals that I've ever been aware of. And uh, to this day, the submarine force, uh, we, we bear the scars of that, and we continue to make sure that we always have torpedoes that work and are properly tested and are the best in the world. So <clears throat> the campaign shifted south from Manila down to the Dutch East Indies. Um, one thing just to recall, the Dutch East Indies <clears throat> is really the ultimate prize that the Japanese are looking for, right? This is where the oil is. This is where the rubber is, is where all the resources is for the greater uh, East Asia co-prosperity fear, fear. So while some people have said, well, Pearl Harbor was the biggie, that was the that was the, the biggest thing that happened on December 7th. Pearl Harbor was not the main effort. The only reason the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor was to, to attrite the Pacific fleet so that it couldn't come across the Pacific to uh, break up the rest of their operations. This area here, the Dutch East Indies, was the main objective of the Japanese operations in December 1941. So our submarines <clears throat> eventually moved south uh, from the Philippines. They were operating out of Surabaya on the island of Java, and they were operating out of Port Darwin in Australia in the months of uh, <clears throat> January and February of 1942. Uh, here's another look at the, the Dutch East Indies. If you look at the topography, uh, this was a much different area than where the, the Navy had been operating earlier. Uh, lots of uh, narrow seas, straits, shoals, very poorly charted. We had several ships run aground and actually be taken out of the war uh, during this time frame. Uh, it's also a tough place to defend. I mean, if you look, there's a there's a, a, a an area to the to the left of Borneo there, to the west of Borneo, where the Japanese could come. They could come between Borneo and Celebes. They could go to the east of Celebes, all headed down to the prize of Java and the rest of those islands <clears throat> in that chain. So it's a tough place to defend. Uh, and over the course of uh, January and February, you can see the Japanese marched south. Uh, they made landings in Borneo and Celebes, headed towards their eventual uh, prize in, in Java. Uh, they even uh, had those same aircraft carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor were actually used on the 19th of February to attack Darwin. And there was actually more planes that attacked Darwin Australia then attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, the United States had uh, kind of come together with its other allies in the region, the British, the Australians, and the Dutch. Uh, Admiral Tommy Hart kind of got, uh, I guess I would say, stabbed in the back, that's my opinion, by, uh, by, by his Dutch hosts there who felt that he was too old and not aggressive enough. Uh, I would I would disagree with that argument, but uh, in the end, he was recalled, and a Dutch admiral took charge of the entire naval operation. Uh, you see on the left there that uh, there was only five major warships, and by major, these ships were light cruisers and two heavy, three light cruisers and two heavy cruisers. That's all they had to face the entire Japanese fleet. Uh, and uh, in a series of battles at the end of February 1942. Battle of the Java Sea, the Battle of the Sunda Strait, uh, those ships were all sunk. Uh, and essentially at that point, uh, the campaign was lost. The Japanese owned the air, the Japanese owned the sea. And so the remaining forces, including those uh, remaining 26 American submarines uh, who had not been sunk, we had lost a few in the campaign, they all retreated down to the south. And where did they go? They went way south. Uh, you look here, you look at Australia, uh, there's a tiny little dot there on the uh, the southwest corner, and that's called Perth. That's where our submarines went. Uh, from Manila, that is 4,400 nautical miles uh, from Manila all the way down to the port of Fremantle, where, where our submarines were based. From there, they'd operate, uh, you know, they'd kind of recover, regroup, <clears throat> resupply, get the crews rested up because the crews had not spent three months really without any any time off. They had been out on patrol all the time. When they pulled into port, it was all about repairing the boats and then going back out again. So those guys were really tired. Um, 
we operated out of Fremantle uh, for the next uh, three years. The Australia, I've been there. The Australians love us. I never had to pay for a beer in, uh, in uh, Australia when, when they found out I was a submariner. So there's your overview, right? That's kind of what happened. I'd like to shift now to, to part two of this thing. And I call it researching research rabbit holes because that's what I did. <laughs> I ended up going down a large number of rabbit holes as I'm trying to find out some things, do some research. Uh, and also call it how I spent my 64th birthday because I basically spent 24 hours on my birthday, including overnight, finding something. And the guy who is the in instigator, I guess the inspiration for all this, his picture is there. His name is Arthur Killam. And Arthur Killam is from Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, he was a crew member on the USS sea, sea Dragon, one of those 29 American submarines in Manila at the start of the war. And I found, in doing some research, I found an oral history video uh, of him that uh, uh, was done by the National World War II Museum, where he talked about his time at the beginning of the war. And it was fascinating. And, and as we all know, we've lost all, all these heroes. There are so few of them left. And so to have some place where, where I can you know, hear what he has to say, get some quotes, understand his mindset is just gold. And so I was fascinated listening to his, uh, his video. Uh, and I listened to him tell the, the story about Sea Dragon. Uh, the, ship, uh, the ship was bom uh, next, next to the Sea Lion, which was bombed in Manila Bay. Uh, he was injured in that, in that, uh, attack. Uh, but one of the things that I found very interesting is in, in listening to him talk about, he talked about how the sea dragon eventually escaped from Manila after getting repaired and headed South to Surabaya. And he said, I had a couple of shipmates that were, went to, had gone to the Naval hospital and I have no idea whatever happened to those guys. It was almost like an offhand remark, but I could see that it was something that that hit, was bothering him. He and he said, "I again, I, I never figured out what happened to those guys." And so, as I'm taking notes, I actually wrote down on the side, "Wow, this might be an interesting story to to pull the thread on." Well, that's what I did. Um, there is uh, the USS Sea Dragon. Sea Dragon is a sister ship of the USS Sea Lion, which was sunk in uh, in Manila Bay. Um, and uh, here is Arthur Killam uh, as a young sailor on the left, later as a chief electrician's mate uh, in the center there. And, and there he is uh, uh, recently. And to the best of my knowledge, although I've looked at this, I think Mr. Killam is still with us. I pray that he is. Uh, and if he is, he's, he's over 100 years old. So God bless him. Uh, he has inspired me. And, you know, as a submariner myself, I got to say, you are, you are one of my heroes. Um, so anyway, he told his story about uh, what happened in the war, uh, what happened with the, the good ship uh, Sea Dragon at the early part of the war. Um, and I went back, you know, later that same evening after I'd watched this video, I said, I'm going to try and find, it, find this out. Why, why not now? You know, if not now, when? So I started doing some research online through some areas. I also have a huge library with all kinds of geek stuff. Yes, yes, I are a submarine geek. So I spent a lot of time looking at uh, some of the things that I had, <clears throat> and I found out some interesting information. By the way, this is a picture of, uh, it's, a, it's more of a sketch of a uh, sea lion being hit on the 10th of December by the Japanese air attack. She's the one there in the center on the right you're looking at the at the stern of the USS Sea Dragon that was tied up alongside the Sea Dragon or alongside Sea Lion, and to the left of uh, of Sea Lion is a U.S. minesweeper, the Bitter. They're all tied up, nested together. Um, I found out a couple of things in in doing my research. I found out in looking at the muster rolls that there was a first class electrician's mate by the name of William Paul Verba who was assigned to the Sea Dragon. And in looking at it, it says on the 17th of November, he was transferred to the Naval Hospital at Kanakao. Oh my gosh, that must be one of the guys, right? That must be one of the guys that Arthur Killam was talking about when he said that he uh, didn't know what happened to him. So I went and I, I looked and I did some more, more research, found out 
he disappears from the Sea Dragons muster rolls. But then he shows up in April 1942 on another submarine, USS Permit, which had started out the war in Manila. Uh, Permit was in Fremantle, Australia, where all the submarines had retreated to. And Verba was assigned there as a first class electrician, later went on to become a chief petty officer. And as best I could tell, he, he uh, served out the entire war on the USS Permit. So there's a guy who, you know, that's one of the two. And he, he was fine. He somehow made his way out of Manila. I, I can't tell how he got from Manila to Fremantle, but he did. <clears throat> and then I found that this other guy, uh, Petty Officer First Class Samuel Frederick Harrison, uh, he was uh, sent to the Kanakao uh, Naval Hospital in October of 1941. And there's the second guy, two guys that were that that uh, that Arthur Killen was talking about. Turns out he was a prisoner of war. He was captured, uh, served out the the war, survived, and was repatriated in 1945. So first first issue solved, right? There's there's the answer. But I dug a little bit further. Okay, <clears throat> I wanted to find out a little bit more about what happened to Killam and what happened to the rest of his his uh, crew on the Sea Dragon. Kill him when the bomb landed next door to him, uh, uh, next door to Sea Dragon. Uh, a a kill him was in the conning tower. Okay, he was in there with the exec ship's executive officer, uh, with the ship's uh, corpsman, the pharmacist mate, and also with this gentleman on the left, Ensign Sam Samuel Hunter. <clears throat> a uh, piece of shrapnel from that bomb came through the conning tower, Sea Dragon, and uh, killed. Uh, Ensign Hunter instantly. And Killam talks about that in his interview. He said, I was there when it happened. He mentions that he actually was in the standing in the hatch when the bomb hit. The blast knocked him off. He fell 13 feet to the con uh, control room deck below, landed on his back, had a, a knob that hit him right in the base of his spine. Uh, and he was just in, in incredible pain, uh, which was later kind of worked on by the by the ship's corpsman. Uh, but he said that was the only person we had that was killed. Well, I did some other research. I looked at a few other places and found out that there was another Sea Dragon guy who was in the sick bay in, in, uh, in Cavite. And it was this guy on the right, uh, Seaman First Class Walter Benson. Uh, and he shows up on the muster rolls uh, right before December 7th, and then all of a sudden he's gone. Uh, and so he had been in sick bay. Uh, Cavite Navy Yard was essentially leveled and uh, and a terrible fire, and he was actually killed. So that was determined later. So, <clears throat> so I found out that that was interesting information that really isn't covered in a whole bunch of other places. So that was kind of neat. There's a picture of Cavite Navy Yard uh, where thousands were, were killed, uh, and essentially the whole place was destroyed. All right, so now I'm I'm pulling threads. I'm continuing to go through to try and find out what else is there. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, Mr. Killam talked about was the fact that he was in the conning tower of the Sea Dragon on December 10th uh, during the bombing with the ship's pharmacist mate. And that's this gentleman here on the left, Chief Pharmacist Mate Arthur Diaz. Okay, On the left as a young sailor, in the center as a uh, as a chief petty officer. So he's a chief pharmacist mate. Essentially, submarines don't have doctors. <clears throat> They'll take a, 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 a pharmacist mate. Today, they're, they're, they're called corpsmen. But they're, those guys are trained up, and they take care of the crew. There's only one of them. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, uh, you know, a submarine can get underway. Anybody can be left in port, but you have to have two people. You have to have the captain, which sort of makes sense, and you have to have the pharmacist mate or the corpsman. They have to be on board to take care of the crew. So now I'm getting a little bit more interested because one of the things I find out is that uh, uh, Petty or Chief Diaz disappears from the from the muster rolls of the Sea Dragon after December seventh. What happened to him? He's not listed anywhere as being injured. Uh, I wonder if maybe he. You know, he was there. He would have been right next to Ensign Hunter when he was hit by shrapnel. Did he go with him? Did he go take him uh, to uh, to the hospital and then didn't make it back to the ship before it left uh, some four or five days later? Don't know. It's kind of a mystery. 
So it's something I have to find out, right? So now I'm, you can see all these things are starting to tie together. So as I mentioned, uh, submarine has to have uh, a, a pharmacist mate to get underway. So Diaz is gone. He's not in the muster roll. So I go and look and I find this gentleman, pharmacist mate first class Wheeler Lipes. He reports to the ship on the 10th of December. Okay, this makes sense now. I've got, you know, the chief is now gone for whatever reason. Not sure. Got to find that out. Got to find out where he went. Here's his replacement who just shows up. <clears throat> Don't know where he came from. Probably came from the submarine tender. But anyway, he's the pharmacist mate on the Sea Dragon. And then I start putting other things together. Now, wait a minute. I know a little bit about submarine history. The Sea Dragon is the submarine where they performed an emergency appendectomy underway on war patrol in 1942. That must be this guy. This, this, this gentleman here must be the one who did the uh, emergency appendectomy. And I look at it and I find out, sure enough, he's the guy. Doc, Doc Lipes and all submarine corpsmen or pharmacist mates are referred to as Doc, even though they're not doctors. That's, you know, makes sense, right? On the 8th of September, 1942, he performed an emergency appendectomy uh, using handmade tools. On the right, you can see him with his wife later on. He's got spoons that he used for retractors. Uh, that's a little uh, like a, a colander or a sieve that he, he used to, to put ether to, to knock the guy out. You can see that in the, in the painting on the left there. So interesting, you know, I, I'm, I'm pulling threads, I'm finding things, I'm finding connections. Um, turns out that uh, Doc Lipes also uh, was very good friends with Arthur Killam. And uh, Arthur, uh, when he was in uh, Manila, he had hurt his back, as I mentioned, when he fell down the hatch. He didn't tell anybody except, except the doc because he was afraid that they were going to say, OK, we got to send you to the hospital. And he did not want to go because he was afraid. He knew his boat was going to be leaving and he wanted to go with it. So Doc Lipes was treating him for his back problems, which was what, chip discs and other problems like that. All right. So now I go on to the next thing. You can see where this is going. I just keep going. Uh, who was the guy that Doc Lipes operated on? Who was the uh, emergency appendectomy guy? Well, I find out it's this guy on the left, Gunner's mate, third class, Daryl Dean Rector. Okay, he comes from uh, the Midwest, uh, reports to enlists in the Navy in 1941, uh, ends up reporting to Sea Dragon in Fremantle, Australia in May 1942. So he's on board uh, for just a couple of months when he has comes down with appendicitis. By the way, he was only 17 when he uh, when he enlisted in 1941. So he's only 18 when he has this uh, emergency appendectomy. Um, and you can see the picture on the right. Made made it through just fine. There's uh, the doc and his patient, uh, and uh, and uh, Petty Officer Rector is pointing to his uh, his scar there. So now I, I I look further. Right, pull the thread further. Turns out uh, that uh, Dean Rector has an older brother who was assigned to the USS Pigeon at the start of the war. And he's a boilermaker first class. Okay, well, again, as a submariner and having some knowledge of history, I remember the USS Pigeon was the ship that earned, well, let's, we got a picture of it somewhere. Where is it? There it is. Tiny little ship. Used to be a minesweeper. It's now a submarine rescue vessel. Okay, it's in Manila at the start of the war. This is the first United States Navy ship to ever be awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. And it did it, uh, not, only, uh, it not only got one Presidential Unit Citation, it got two. So if my memory serves me right, it, won, it was awarded the first and the second Presidential Unit Citations, and one of only a few ships to get two. Uh, it was awarded that because on that day of December 10th in, uh, in uh, Manila, it towed the sea dragon away from the sinking and burning uh, sea lion from this, you remember, from this uh, this uh, sketch here. So Pigeon got in there real close. The, on the right, the, the pier was, was covered in flames. There was uh, torpedo warheads and, and air flash exploding. Sea lion was sunk and burning. Pigeon gets in there and actually tows the sea dragon clear. So Rector, who ended up, uh, Dean Rector, who ended up on, uh, on uh, the Sea Dragon, his brother was involved in towing that ship to safety before he ever uh, uh, was there. So what happened to him? Pull the thread. Turns out uh, that uh, Earl Rector was, uh, ended up on Corregidor, uh, where he fought the Japanese landings in, uh, in May of 1942. 
earned the Silver Star. He was a prisoner of war throughout the war, repatriated. And there you see him with his bride uh, after the war. Pretty cool. Um, so now, real briefly, we're going to talk about Sea Lion. We'll shift gears to that ship that's next to Arthur Killam's boat, all right? So Sea Lion, and this is a, it, it's a, not a very good picture, but it's the only one I could find, but I have to tell the story. Um, Petty Officer Third Class uh, Valentine Lester Paul, and that's, it's an interesting first name, and you think I might got it wrong, but nope, that is his first name, and that is his last name. Well, Petty Officer Paul reported to the Sea Dragon in September of 1941. Just two months later, he's transferred to the ship next to them, the Sea Lion, and then he's killed on that day uh, in the attack on Cavite Navy Yard when the bomb basically punctures the ship and explodes right in his uh, operating area and maneuvering area. So how's that for, for fate, right? You know, you think about uh, how things happen uh, and, and interesting that, uh, you know, this poor this poor gentleman happened to be the guy that was there. Fate intervened. There's another look at the sea lion after she had been sunk and destroyed. Um, the next tie. I mentioned that Admiral Hart earlier had evacuated on the shark from Manila to the south. Well, there's a picture of the USS Shark, SS-174, uh, pre-war. Turns out the shark is the first uh, American submarine sunk in World War II by Japanese anti-submarine forces. Uh, and so in February 1942, she's lost with all hands. Another personal tie and coincidence that I have with this, uh, that gentleman who was the captain, uh, Louis Shane, uh, was a Naval Academy classmate of my grandfather, class of 1926. So as the Navy is uh, wont to do, they will often name uh, ships after previous ships. And so in 1943, there is another USS Shark uh, named in honor of the one that was sunk, and that's the shark too. And that's a picture of her going down the ways uh, at her launching. Um, the next slide is a picture of a Japanese freighter. We're we're starting to wrap this up, folks. Just so if you're, if you're bearing with me. Everybody's going, where are we going? Oh my gosh, I'm getting whiplash here. The Arisan Maru was what was known came to be known later as the hell at one of the hell ships it was used to evacuate american uh, prisoners of war from the philippines in 1944 as douglas macarthur closed in on the philippines for his landings in october so on the 24th of october the arisan maru uh loaded 1700 prisoners of war and got underway to head to formosa <clears throat> well she was found by an American submarine and uh, and sunk. There was nothing that said that, you know, they, they didn't advertise. It wasn't a hospital ship. It was just a, a freighter, right? So it was sunk. And uh, uh, tragically, only nine American prisoner of wars uh, survived the sinking of that ship. Turns out, uh, if I looked later, found that uh, Chief Diaz, the first pharmacist made on the Sea Dragon, he uh, he was a prisoner of war in a prison camp in the Philippines. He was one of those uh, 1,700 prisoners of war that was loaded onto the Arisan Maru. And tragically, he was not one of the few survivors. Uh, the next uh, piece of news is that uh, that Arisan Maru was sunk by the USS Shark II. Uh, it was sunk on the 24th of October. Uh, lost with all hands. Essentially, uh, it was after it sank the Arisan Maru, it was counterattacked by the by the escorts, uh, which sank it. So now, final wrap-ups in progress here. Let's go back to Gunner's mate, Dean Rector, okay, our appendectomy guy. <clears throat> uh, later in 1943, he got transferred off of the Sea Dragon. Uh, they actually sent him back to sea eventually on a hot running boat. And that boat was the USS Tang, uh, probably one of the more famous U.S. submarines in World War II. Skipper uh, was awarded the Medal of Honor, uh, sank uh, the second most number of ships of any U.S. submarine in World War II. Well, the Tang was sunk. Only, uh, only a few miles away from where the shark was sunk the next day. And Petty Officer Dean Rector, our appendectomy guy, 
uh, was on board. He was not a survivor. There were a few people that survived, uh, but he was not one of them. And uh, the last thing that I found that uh, kind of interested me uh, are two pharmacist mates on the Sea Dragon, Chief Diaz and, uh, and Doc Lipes. Both those guys are uh, in Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, Chief Diaz, obviously his body is not there, but he's memorialized with that headstone. Uh, and, uh, and Doc Lipes uh, is buried there, uh, passed away in 2005. One of the things I find interesting is you see all the things it talks about. He eventually got commissioned, served as a, as a medical officer uh, in the Navy for years. Um, and all those things he did, he's retired as a lieutenant commander. What does it say at the very bottom? It says he was a submarine pharmacist mate. That's what he was proud of. Most Probably what, that's what he was most proud of. Uh, so the journey ends, right? Just to show you real quickly, some of the research tools I use to do this. I spent some time in the National Archives uh, coming up with the muster rolls. Initially started with uh, with Mr. Killam in the National World War II Museum. Uh, Fold3, which is an excellent place to find stuff. I think that's part of Ancestry.com. And then a couple other websites. One of them uh, really associated with submarines and another find a grave uh, had some really interesting information for me. Um, so the last thing I would tell you is, you know, I was just, all I did this just investigating one submarine. I started with USS Sea Dragon and went to a few others, but and I very briefly looked and found that there was other sailors. You know, if, if they'd been left behind from Sea Dragon, there must have been others. And sure enough, there was some Sea Lion sailors. S thirty six, S thirty eight had some sailors that were left behind in Manila. And here's kind of what happened to them. So there's probably others. So I guess what I would say is there's uh, there's probably more research to be done ahead. So that kind of concludes the story, and it really is a story. And I know we took a lot of twists and turns, saw a lot of coincidences, uh, but I hope that uh, you got an appreciation for these uh, these young men, our, our heroes from back then that served, what they went through, uh, and the trials and travails of the U.S. Asiatic Fleet submarines. So I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm interested if there's any questions out there. I'd love to talk about this, as you can tell. Thank you, Jim. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, great story. And uh, I love the way you connect all those threads together. It was uh, kind of a small community, I guess, of submariners in uh, in World War II and easy to find some connections, uh, but get lost in history too often. Uh, and let me start with that question before we go to some uh, that have been sent in. And incidentally, if you are Watch it on Facebook or on YouTube uh, in the comment session, uh, sections. Uh, if you have some questions for Jim, please throw them in and I'll pass them on to him. But let me start with one uh, that I, I think you have the background to answer. Seems to me uh, amongst U.S. Navy personnel, submariners are kind of a different breed. Uh, what, what sets them apart from the rest of the, the Navy? Uh, I think part of it has to do with the mission that submarines perform. Uh, again, we're not normally, although we, you know, these days we do operate a little bit and we talk more, uh, with the rest of the Navy, but our missions take us out alone and unafraid, all, all, you know, out someplace where we're surrounded and, uh, and outnumbered. And so to do that, uh, it takes, uh, it takes a crew that uh, is willing to work together. Submariners, one thing they're known for is, you know, the guy who works in the galley, who's a cook in the galley, if he qualifies and earns his dolphins, he knows how to stop flooding. He knows how to fight a fire. He knows how the nuclear reactor work. He doesn't necessarily operate on it, but he, he understands the principles. Uh, so everybody who qualifies in submarines and earns their silver or gold dolphins, uh, they have to know the entire boat. Uh, while they focus on their own job, they have to have a good understanding of the whole thing. So they're very smart people. Uh, they're very motivated. If you ever get a chance to listen to Arthur Killam's uh, video from the National World War II Museum, he talks about that quite a bit. What makes them special? Why are they so such a tight group? Um, you know, there's there's a little bit, there's a bar, there's a higher bar, I think, that 
that's set for uh, people to operate on submarines. And I'm biased, of course. Uh, my, my brother is a, a surface warfare officer. <laughs> and, you know, I think he worked as hard or harder than I ever did. Uh, but uh, but I think the submariners uh, kind of stand apart. And, it, you know, you can read all kinds of literature down the years that talks about how the submarine, in fact, I think uh, Michener, uh, the author Michener in some of his books uh, in South Pacific, he mentioned, you know, I, that he saw the submariners standing apart there talking about their their boats that they love so much. They love them and they hate them. You know, they we always have a love-hate relationship with the, with the submarines, but in the end, we, we do love them. So I don't know. There's some thoughts for you. Herman Wotes uh, novels, War, uh, Winds of War and War and Remembrance, uh, features some submarine actions. That yes, are, it does. Right. Very interesting. A um, few more comments come in. Uh, Tim Miller just wanted you to know he's a retired CPO watching. So thank you, uh, Chief Petty Officer Miller, right, Chief. For, uh, for joining in. Uh, one of our colleagues at the D Day Memorial, Andreas, uh, just commended you very interesting and informative and sends her thanks. Um, as does Paul who said, thank you. Very interesting. Jen asked a question that I can answer, which is, uh, is this being recorded? She missed part of it. And yes, you'll be able to find this on our Facebook and on our YouTube channel afterwards. So, uh, absolutely. If you missed part of it or you want to hear some of it again, uh, you can find it later on. Um, another, uh, another question, uh, give you, give you a little bit of a, what if, uh, what if the U S subs had had better torpedoes, more reliable torpedoes this early in the game. What what kind of a game changer would that have been? So <clears throat> there are some people that have said that essentially the problems that uh, American submarines had at the start of the war were twofold. One, bad torpedoes, and two, cautious skippers. Um, I, I certainly agree that the torpedoes was a factor in the in the poor performance uh, by our submarines at the start of the war. Um, uh, I disagree a little bit with that the fact that the skippers were cautious. Uh, there was a few that were fired, but uh, but most of them were doing their best. Uh, a lot, of, a couple of them left uh, asked to be relieved because they they felt that they they weren't performing. They weren't getting hits. Well, they weren't getting hits because their torpedoes were bad. Um, but essentially, if we had had a, a perfect torpedo, the Mark 14 torpedo and the Mark 6 magnetic exploder had been absolutely perfect at the start of the war, I don't think it would have changed the outcome. Uh, we might have sunk a few more ships, uh, but uh, the Japanese uh, had just an amazingly uh, well orchestrated scheme of operations, uh, and, and they, they did it so well that I don't think it would have... Uh, it might have delayed uh, them getting down to their eventual uh, place that they were hoping to get to in Java, but but I think it would have happened nonetheless. And you know, going forward in the war, uh, obviously U.S. submarine operations are going to improve. The torpedoes are going to improve, and it became a stranglehold on the Japanese home islands. So uh, you know, ultimately, I guess nothing succeeds like success. Um, Mitchell asked a question that uh, you, you briefly touched on just now. Is it true that a lot of submarine captains were relieved for being too cautious or yeah, too there was effective? A, there was a total, total of eight that were relieved in this uh, first six months campaign uh, and a couple of masks to be relieved. Um, one was a medical problem. Uh, one was the skipper of the Stingray, that boat that uh, met, off, met up and with the Lingayan invasion convoy on the 22nd of December and didn't get any attacks off. He he basically was extremely cautious and he was relieved when he pulled into port. Um, so yeah, there was a few that were relieved. Uh, one of the things that I have found uh, is amongst submariners, you know, they talk and they know it's a very small community, so they know each other. Uh, there was one gentleman uh, by the name of uh, Bub Ward, who was the, he was the executive officer on the Sea Dragon. So he was the guy, one of those guys in the conning tower when that bomb hit and when uh, Ensign Hunter was killed and when uh, Arthur Killam was knocked down the hatch. Um, he, his comment was, of all those people that were relieved, none of them, I mean, they all basically deserved it. He said, you know, everybody agreed. They nodded their head. Yep, those guys should have been relieved. So it's not unusual. I mean, it's not something you can say, how could this happen? Because these are guys that have operated in wartime and they're supposed to train and be ready. But that 
how do you how do you handle that initial shift from from peacetime to wartime? I mean, I I ask myself, how would I do that? It would be a tough thing to 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 get done. So, um, yep, there were a few, but uh, you know, there was there were plenty of guys that went out and did their jobs, and until they got good torpedoes, uh, they weren't as they weren't successful either. And you know, you could find. Uh equivalents and other branches of the military world war ii as well ground commanders who needed to be relieved or pilots who just you know didn't cut it so right. uh no, nothing unusual um but again obviously unfortunate that the the torpedoes weren't cooperating very much what usually happened in those cases did they promote the xo up to captain or did they bring in a new one no, usually they bring in a new one. I mean, they had a they had a pool of people, and that, you know, one of them actually was the, the the captain of the Sea Lion that was sunk on the on the tenth of December. He's all of a sudden he's in the pool, right? He doesn't have a boat anymore, so he's attached to the staff. And when an opening came up, they put him on the sailfish, uh, uh, another submarine. So he he went out. The skipper of the sailfish had a breakdown uh, in the middle of the action, and his XO drove the ship back. And so, you know, let's put somebody else in there. So usually they they would find somebody else to come in. Uh, let me ask a quick question uh, about uh, Thomas Hart. I may be mistaking a couple of figures, but did didn't he serve briefly in the Senate after World War II? Admiral Hart, uh, yes, okay. he did. He oh, he he uh, he served the war uh, as a four star admiral, and then uh, I think uh, if I remember correctly, he's from the state of Connecticut, and uh, the 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 incumbent senator died in office, and so he was selected to serve out the last two years of his term. Uh, he said he would do it. He wasn't really thrilled about it. He did it for two years. They they asked him to run for re-election. He said, "No, I'm done. I, this is not for me." You know, so he he finished. But yeah, he was a senator. Oh, excellent. Well, I don't believe any other questions have come in. Uh, if you come up with some questions later on, or you're watching this after the fact, and uh, you have a question, feel free to email. Uh, education at dday.org, and I'll pass your question on to Jim. Uh, but uh, Jim, for now, we want to thank you again for a fascinating talk and a great look back, some important history that needs to be remembered, and uh, look forward to having you for your next virtual talk. Somewhere Love to do it down the road. So, thank you, Jim, and thank all right. you to all of you who've tuned in uh, for our talk. Uh, we have more. Um, virtual lectures coming up and of course our podcast uh, now launched so uh, plenty more opportunities to learn about World War II through our educational initiatives. So uh, that will do it for today and again thank you to all you who have tuned in and uh, we look forward to seeing you visit also in person in Bedford during this uh, great spring weather we're getting. So again uh, thank you again uh, my name is John Long the National D-Day Memorial and I look forward to seeing you another time.